Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, yes, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk about higher education, but I'm going to start with asking you a question first. Uh, most of you are in school, as I understood. Uh, one question, how many of you are planning on continuing their learning careers at a university or a college? Just a show of hands. <laughs> Almost everyone. Okay. I was uh, expecting nothing less, of course. Well, um, before I start talking about uh, the, the, the shifts in, in the higher education, I want to take you on a, a little um, uh, experiment or a little thought experiment. I'm going to draw you two scenarios of what your possible um, life and studying uh, journey on a university might look like. So I'm going to paint you two pictures, two scenarios, um, and then afterwards I'm going to ask you which one of these scenarios uh, appeals most to you. So which one would you prefer? So we're going to start with uh, looking at a girl. We're going to uh, call her Noah. She's on her way to her first lecture on business administration. She just uh, registered for it. She's very excited because she hears that the lecturer is a, a very renowned uh, speaker on the subject. He's also known from television and newspapers. He's very engaging, very inspiring. And uh, here she is in her first lecture. It's a very large room. 250 students, um, the, the teacher at the front uh, having great slides, great uh, uh, examples, so she's really having a good time. Um, and the way this, the learning of this, uh, this first block is organized is she, uh, uh, well, she's going to take weekly lectures, and during those lectures she's also going to read books, so she has three pretty large books to, uh, to study, and of course the lecturers uh, help her with that. And uh, um, the end result of this is going to be that she has to do a multiple choice exam in the end of uh, the eight weeks. And this uh, exam will test if she understood and, uh, uh, and remembered the knowledge. So this is the first scenario. Uh, Noah going to a, a program in business administration. Now consider this guy, let's call him Flynn for now. He's also very interested in uh, business administration, but he's a little bit more hands-on type of guy. And he chose uh, a program where it's not so much about lecture than doing a lot of individual uh, reading and studying, but he chose a program where he has a lot of tutorials, where they work on assignments and uh, work in small groups, and the teacher is uh, somebody who is there to give feedback and to help them study. Also, during this, uh, uh, his first eight weeks, he is divided into a group of four, and with this group of four, they have to work on a real-life uh, solution for a marketing problem of a, a real-life company. So they really have an assignment that was given to them, and they have to work together with this group of four. They meet multiple times a week, uh, and they have to kind of use all the knowledge that they, that they have learned to come up with a solution. At the end, they need to present this solution to, uh, uh, to the company and also, of course, to their peers and the, and the teacher. And, um, well, they are assessed not so much with an exam, but they have to write a group report together, and also uh, they have to uh, do the presentation, which is also graded. Okay, so these are two different scenarios, same subject, but a very different approach. And I would now like to give you uh, 30 seconds to maybe talk to one of your neighbors and exchange which one of these scenarios appeals to you most and why. So just find somebody to discuss, and I'll come back to you in 30 seconds.
end the discussion for now. Maybe there's more time later to finish your discussion. But I'm really curious what the outcome is. So maybe, again, with a raise of hands. So who thinks if they had to choose, if you had to choose, which, would, uh, which one of you would choose for the first scenario? Okay, so do I have a quick count? I think maybe one-third of the students, yeah? And who would definitely choose for the second approach? A little bit more, but uh, fairly the same. Uh, maybe can I ask you in the front? Uh, one of you, uh, why would you prefer uh, the second approach? It's more hands-on, it's more engaging, it's more involved, yeah. it's learning by doing. It's learning by doing, exactly, it's more hands-on, it actually has more, um, uh, yeah, learning by doing, as you said. Okay, good. So remember this, huh? so um, it's nice that there's a, there's a quite a division in the room, it's really almost 50-50, <coughs> um, and it's good to realize for yourself which one of these approaches do I like most? Because the approaches in higher education <laughs> differ tremendously. And so many universities, different countries, different universities use different approaches to learning in higher education. But today it's about paradigm shifts. So I also want to look at this from the point of view of different approaches. So first what I'm going to do is show these two uh, approaches and, and uh, give them some more general terms to understand them a little better. Uh, when we look at the first approach, which is about lectures and, and reading and studying by yourself, uh, we usually refer to this as the content-centered the content centered uh, uh, approach to learning, which means that it's highly focused on knowledge transmission. Yeah? So there's the expert, the, the, the teacher who shares his knowledge, does it in an engaging and motivating way, tries to inspire the students, but the students mostly uh, <coughs> focus on comprehending and remembering the topics. And usually in this kind of setting, this is what the, the learning result is. The other one is what we often refer to as the learning-centered um, approach. Because here it's not so much about uh, only transmitting knowledge or remembering knowledge, it's actually doing something with it. And the learning is more focused on what can students actually do with the things that they learn. So they actually, yeah, just as the comment was made, it's more hands-on, so they, they get a sense of why it's useful to, to do this. This also implies a different role for the teacher. Because here, as you can see, content-centered also means quite teacher-centered. So there's a teacher in front of the, of, the, uh, of the class, being engaging, being the expert, sharing his wisdom, but there's little interaction here, eh? there's little room for the student to engage in the learning activity. So that's why we say this teacher, and it's an expression, you could refer to him or her as the sage on the stage. On the other hand, you can obviously see there's a different role for the teacher there, because the students are centered, it's about what they do with the knowledge, it's about creating their ideas. So the, the teacher is, is very significant, but he's not that central, or she, to the learning process. So here what we see is the, the, the teacher, as uh, related to the sage on the stage, moves more to a role of a guide on the staff. And this, uh, to some extent, is, is uh, well, it's, a, it's illustrative of a movement that is going on uh, in higher education. So the question is, what is the shifting paradigms? What are we dealing with here? And I do want to make a point that we have had these two approaches next to each other. It's, th they coexist at the moment. There are many programs where there are many lectures in many different universities, uh, but there are also a lot of schools who implement this, this problem-solving approach to teaching. Um, usually what you see a lot, obviously, in a lot of colleges and universities, they use a combination of uh, first maybe uh, uh, helping students understand some foundational knowledge, some facts, things that they have to understand before they can actually apply it to a project. So that makes sense hopefully, that there's a combination. However, when we put these, these uh, approaches next to each other, it, they do illustrate uh, a shift in the thinking of teaching and learning in higher education. And this is what we could call a shift from the old paradigm to the new paradigm. And here I show it with some uh, characteristics. Um, because when we look at the, the, the lecture, eh? so the lecture in the, in the first the content-centered approach, basically when it's a lecture and the teacher is telling his or her story, it means that the students, well, maybe not passively learn, but at least they're, they're quite passively listening. So they're listening to what the teacher, maybe they're making notes, but they're not actually involved in doing things. 
Now, and now, momentarily, all already uh, some decades, for some decades, the, the whole approach of active learning uh, has become more and more uh, dominant, and also because there's a lot of evidence that students only learn when they have actually done something with the material. And so for lectures, that doesn't mean that we don't want lectures anymore, but in a lecture, now we say that teachers not only talk, but they should also involve the students, maybe with questions, with discussions, with uh, uh, a little bit of an assignment during the lecture. Uh, this might also give some uh, uh, uneasiness with some teachers. I work as a teacher trainer, and I was once uh, talking about this subject with a, with a lecturer, and he said, yeah, well, it's all very nice, that is activating students, and I know it's important, but if I do that during my lecture, where do I keep the time to cover the content? And so it's a little bit uh, the uneasiness of um, yeah, trying to activate students while still holding on to this old idea, old idea of I have to transmit my knowledge, I have to convey everything I know. So this is an important shift. Um, well, related to this active learning is also uh, the shift from a teacher center to a student center. It relates to the content centered versus the, uh, the student centered approach, uh, content versus learning centered. Sorry, um, and what you see is that the teacher. Um, in the new paradigm takes a role that is less central, less important in the sense of that it's controlling everything. So it's really about uh, also involving, questioning maybe students, how do you like, learn best? What do, you, what do you need? What are your goals? So this is a clear shift that is happening. Um, also what you see now, which is embraced by many colleges and universities now, is the whole in, the concept of social interaction. Um, so, um, uh, not only having the teacher in, be more involved with students, asking them questions, open questions, get them to think critically about stuff instead of just telling them what they know, it's also about um, having students work together and learn from each other. So, that also relates to the second of the last point. Um, it also has to do with students giving each other feedback during a group process, um, learning from each other, and also getting feedback during the learning, uh, learning process, instead of only at the end when you get a grade for an exam. It's about getting feedback while you're still learning so that you can improve. So these are some of the characteristics of what we call the new paradigm in uh, higher education. Um, so this, you could say, from evidence in research and also uh, um, yeah, also in the working field, this new paradigm is, is embraced because it has a lot of um, uh, advantages for um, the learning of students. Uh, because why do we need this? Why do we need to have this different kind of learning? Not only from the point of view that you actually retain knowledge more and it is more flexible, but also we live in a, in a fast-moving world, and we just heard it in the previous talk about uh, innovation and about questioning everything. Well, that is exactly what is the, the competence that is also required in, the, in this new, fast-moving world. And knowledge kind of is outdated before we know it. So learning only knowledge and how things are is uh, less important than gaining new knowledge, trying to apply knowledge, creative thinking skills, working together with, group, uh, with, uh, with other group members. So it's not only something from the research, it's also something from the professional field that there's a real question for uh, this active learning approach. Um, moving it back to your context, you are now probably uh, maybe already considering a subject to study or thinking about where you're going. Um, I just want to say this, that it's important, I think, to have a sense of what kind of learning environment suits you best. Because there are different countries, different schools, who have different ways of approaching this higher learning uh, sorry, higher education, uh, teaching and learning. So with that, uh, I would like to end and, uh, well, I wish you best of luck and uh, much fun in your further learning. <laughs>